Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the Over and Out podcast. This is the short format podcast from which I, Stephen Radford, will bring you conversations with creative souls from many walks of life. Last week I had a conversation with Lauren T. Hart, who is a writer, director, founder and co-owner of the multimedia and motion picture production company Dark Sun Studios. I got to know Lauren through her previous work as a co-host of the very popular and entertaining internet radio show, The Other Side, with her, as her website notes, partner in both life and crime, Denver Robbins. The Other Side is no longer on the air, but I know for a fact that for many others who enjoyed Lauren and Denver's show every Friday night agree, it really was a highlight in what I consider to be the golden era of paranormal radio broadcast shows. You can visit uh, Lauren T. Hart's website at uh, laurentheart.com. And if you want to get with the spelling for that, that's L-A-U-R-E-N-T-H-A-R-T.com. There you can learn, learn more about Lauren, as well as read one of her more recent critically acclaimed serialized online novels of Gods and Mortals. I'm currently looking forward to her next release, which will mark her first collaborative work on a novel. So here we go. Take off your hat and sit back as we join Lauren T. Hart and myself. We join in this conversation just as I begin to ramble on about the fact that I tend to, mm, yeah, overthink things a little bit too much. This was Lauren's response on that topic. Oh, there's no such thing. There's no such thing? No, see, people are always telling me that, you know, you think too much. And I just think that that is what people who don't think as much say. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How could you think too much? I mean, come on. That's like exploding thinking too much, but that, that's not possible. I mean, all aspects get covered because I've thought it all through and yeah. seen it from several different angles. And yeah, I'm not charging, charging headlong without thought towards a brick wall. I have a plan. <laughs> Yeah, and it usually includes the worst case scenario, best case scenario, and everything that's in between. It's, it's good to have. And I think that makes it good for a good writer, too. Which is exactly what I'd like to talk to you about. Awesome. You're very much a collaborative person. As far as, like, screenwriting goes, um, there's a lot of always been collaboration there. It's really rare for me to write something that's just from my perspective and not run it past several other people and, and get their mark on it. Right. And I think that you, the, the first thing that actually uh, was produced in terms of screenplay was, was Dying um, to Play, which was a short in 2005. Was that one of the first films that you actually, one of the first scripts that you've actually had made? That's one of the, well, that's one that's out there. I actually did one before that called Rita's Wedding. Mm -hmm. um, I starred in that one as well. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I've been, I've thought about, uh, putting it somewhere online I just haven't it's kind of one of those people will pull it out every once in a while to have a good laugh because the characters this of Rita is this ridiculous over-the-top kind of character that I'm playing that's just an awful person and um you know people like to relate that to you know I mean it's me playing the character so they like to poke fun a little bit <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think if, if it's um, if you're surrounded by your peers and other other people who act and other people who write, then it's then they're a little bit easier on you for that. But um, uh, you know, people see you in personal life, and it's hard to kind of see you doing other things, other characters, generally. Yeah, I think that it's uh, especially a lot of the people who know me from Facebook who don't know that side of me. A lot of people are surprised that I have an acting background at all, um, and comedic as well and so when people see that then they are kind of a little bit floored that that i i don't know <laughs> that i would go that route or do that or something there it's a little bit surprising i did show a picture i did post a picture of me as rita um in a facebook note quite a while back and people were i get mixed res responses to it she's as rita she wears enough makeup to look like a clown and Often people are like, oh, you look lovely. Just that one I never really understand because it's it's really kind of ridiculous looking. <laughs> it's over the top, yeah. And they, they think that, yeah. That, that, that people are, are quite polite sometimes on Facebook. <laughs> so I sometimes. Think sometimes polite. I look like a clown. You look lovely. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
But um, when when it when it comes back to um, to comedy, um, there was an element of that being um, shown at the um, the Salt Lake Comedy Festival, and you were a part of that this year. Um, yeah, I was teaching a screenwriting class. Mm -hmm. Did you? Uh, I meant to ask how that came to be because mm -hmm. they called and asked, and I'm like, really? Okay, it seemed kind of out of the blue, but yeah, they're like, you came highly recommended. <laughs> Really? By who? I'm just trying to think in the circles of how I knew this person. It was it was weird, kind yeah. of a. Was there any challenge. with the comedy background or? Um, I don't know. That might have been the case. Um, uh, I wrote a, uh, or co-wrote. Well, uh, by the end, it's it's more like a jumble of writers. It was one of the writers on a rewrite of a script called Coma Boy, and. Uh, yeah, that one was comedy based. That one never quite made it to completion. We never got funding for it, but um, it was definitely fun and funny. That's good. Yeah, and, and it, that was um, you say it was a it was a comedy piece. Was it uh, was it like a, a pilot for something or? It's a full length feature. Okay. Um, based on a, a kid who gets hit in the head with a baseball and in a falls into a 20 year coma and you know wakes up 20 years later and okay. it's a little bit unreal because you know 20 year coma you're not going to be okay but you know he just wakes up like it was a long nap and mm -hmm. tries to proceed with his life but he's in a you know 32 year old body and and in his mind he's still 12 so and the fun and comedy ensues from there And I take it that uh, you you look at the character first before the story. You know, it kind of depends. Um, a lot of my uh, stories ideas come from uh, dreams or parts of dreams that I have, um, or sometimes they're already written. And you know, when I, I'm collaborating, often I'm it's somebody else's work that I'm brought and brought aboard and have to kind of tweak here and there and um i like that that's somebody else's story that i can kind of follow but mm -hmm. um the characters i don't know sometimes they're they're fleshed out really well in advance and kind of come with the story and yeah sometimes it's harder for me actually to create a character and then base a story around them i kind of have to know the story and then figure out who they are yeah. as i go um i've tried fleshing out the characters first but just I can't do too much of that. It's easier for me to get an idea or create a, an amalgamation of different people and have them be a character. Um, so I have a, a character that I wrote and he's based on this guy that I know with a few changes in personality. Cause the, mm -hmm. the guy that I know that he's based on loosely based on is um, he's a real hugger and very touchy feely. And, you know, if, Every time we greet, he's like, hey, and he comes over and gives me a big hug. And so I kind of changed that to this person being like an anti-touch. Like he just, so it's like, what would that person's personality be if they weren't a toucher? <laughs> it's it's really fun to play with the opposites. And yeah, that, that's a fun thing to do, to turn things on their heads. Yeah. So when it comes to backstory, um, how far back do you, do you generally go? I mean, I, I hear that for screenwriting, a lot of teachers uh, say that um, that backstory is a big no-no. Don't don't want to touch it. Um, and I've been to several um, lectures and seminars where where they don't they don't want even even say that that backstory exists. The script starts where the script starts. Are, are you a believer in, in backstory or? or comes to um, scripts, yeah. Um, backstory tends to drag it, it you can put backstory in but you have to be very creative with it and very clever um, otherwise it kind of it can detract from the timing and of what's happening um, as far as having or knowing a backstory I go way into depth I mean as I think about the stories and I think about the characters um, I'll create huge backstory just so that I know what their motivation is and what's happening and why they're making the choices that they're making. So personally, as a writer, backstory is huge. Um, as far as like screenwriting, once it's it's written down, um, I know why they're behaving the way they are. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's not usually as important mm -hmm. for the story. 
I mean, it shouldn't be. If the story, especially in a, in a short format like that, where you're working on an hour and a half, two hours, or sometimes less, um, just getting them through the adventure that they're on is usually enough. Yeah, because in a way, it's it's just a familiarity. It's just getting that familiarity uh, down. As you find that with a lot of writers, once they've written a, um, a character for so many years, to put the situations to them a little bit easier and know exactly how they would respond in, in certain ways. Well, and when you bring actors into the mix, um, you let them create that because that's part of the collaborative True. nature of it so much. Because no matter what spin I put on it, um, when I give it to a director, they're going to have their own take and an, yeah. an actor is going to have their own take. And um, I always find it very interesting when I'm talking to um, actors or directors that I've given my work to, their take on what they see the character being like and their motivations for things. And sometimes they align with what I had thought and sometimes they're vastly different. Mm -hmm. But I, the thing that I love about it is that tweak in, in perspective creates this just whole new thing that's just wondrous. I'd like to know a little bit about Anna Dumont and the serialized novel of, of Gods and Mortals. I hear that you have a very interesting method um, in determining her backstory and, and how you would determine. I mean, I, I know there's no spoilers on this one as to what her occupation would be. Um, you know, she started out as kind of a, a mousy character mm -hmm. and I was looking for motivation to write I, my iPod on shuffle. And the first song that came up was a, um, chemical, my chemical romance song. And the song, the lyrics are about a, a hitman, you know, mm -hmm. and I thought that's very interesting and, and wondered what change that would have on her if she were this kind of cold-blooded killer rather than this victim of circumstance. And so, yeah, that's how sh her career path was born. She became a killer. And then I split her in two and gave her twin all her mousiness. <laughs> right. So there's, there's kind of like a, a duplicity to her character. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was quite interesting because I always kind of thought that um, I, I wondered, are you actually leaving it to fate? You know, whatever song that came on the iPod that day, you know, that first track, it could have been anything. I mean, uh, were you taking a gamble or were you actually just listening to that song itself and, and just let the song become? I was just taking a gamble. Thanks. I was like, let's see what you have to offer. If I like it, we'll go with it. If not, uh, I won't, but her character is also a little bit based on, speaking of the amalgamation part, uh, my grandmother has like kind of no sense of humor. And so I, that was another one of the things that I incorporated into that. Um, when Denver reads it, he says, oh, she thinks a lot like you. And I, I kind of think, well, actually she thinks more like my grandmother, but I can see because we're related, there's probably some crossover but I kind of base it on what I think my grandmother would do in that situation, which is kind of odd, but it creates for a unique character. Cause my, my grandmother was, was a strong person, but, but by no means was she, you know, a killer. <laughs> that one was always kind of dark. I, I could have made it darker. I, um, I sometimes, um, uh, the darker things that come through kind of, People are like, you You have problems. So <laughs> I kind of always tone it down a bit. But... It could be, yeah. I'm, I've, I've actually stopped a novel that I was writing because I was writing it in the winter, and I found it a lot easier to write that then. But because of all the daylight that we're getting now, I just can't get into the, the feel of it. So I'm, le I'm kind of put that on the back burner until about October, November time. So I'm looking forward to finishing that um, this, this winter. So, um, but, yeah. It's interesting. When I, most of my writing for of Gods and Mortals, it was easier to do in the in the winter time. It was easier to do when it was dark. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of nighttime writing. Sometimes I would wake up at 4 a.m. and sometimes I was, you know, up till three. But it was just easier to write when the mood was all somber than yeah, when it's all bright, birds are chirping. It's like nah, it's not gonna work out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but yeah, I, mean, I think I think it's all to do with method writing. I, I do believe in that that you have to kind of lose yourself in in the part in order to to come across as effective. Absolutely, I do a lot of talking to myself, and people mm -hmm. are like, "What are you doing?" So I'll go into characters. I know I'm pulling faces and mumbling to myself, and you know sometimes I'm crying depending on the scene and stuff. So yeah, I think it's part of getting into it. Yeah, I I record myself all the time when I'm trying to figure things out and I find that that helps a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree. You have to get into the emotion in order to write it, yes. not in the emotion. I, For me, when I read stuff that I've written that I wasn't in the emotion, I was just going through the motions, mm -hmm. I can feel the difference. So yeah. I, I try and I want that authentic feel to come through. Oh, see, now I wanted to go into stand-up comedy, but I have that problem of uh, I'm not a funny-sounding person, I guess. Uh, like Jack, for example, is hilarious. Like everything he says, whether he means it to be funny or not. I know. Jack, is, is it, even if it's just written, I mean, I haven't really heard Jack speak. Yeah, and some of it doesn't translate over, so I kind of – I can't post him, but yeah. uh, he talks. He just uh, – it's hilarious. He's just a funny kid. Um my other son, Christopher, even when he's trying to be funny, it just doesn't come off as funny. And um, I have that same thing, I think, because I, I would try and tell jokes and a lot of people just, they think they need to explain something to me, like I'm just not getting it. And I'm like, no, I'm making a joke. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not, it's not meant for me to be a stand-up comedian. <laughs> I'm quite an over-the-top person. and I'm, My imagination is wild sometimes. So sometimes if I come up with something that I think is a joke, they might think that I'm just I'm just being Stephen. Yeah. And sarcasm is completely lost on people. Oh, yes. I, I was at an event somewhere, and I'd been stuck in the house speaking, as sometimes happens mm -hmm. with writing in the midst of a project and felt like I just hadn't been anywhere in months. So I was at this event and I was saying, oh gosh, I feel like I haven't left the house in months. And this person said, you haven't? Why not? And I said, yeah, I'm agoraphobic. And they were like, really? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not agoraphobic. If I were agoraphobic, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Not at all. I'm like, no. It's kind, it's kind of obvious you wouldn't be there. That's quite funny. That's funny. Even over the top, you know, like, uh, I, if, I mean, I'll say something, I'm like, oh, I have this little bruise on my hand. I have no idea where I got it. Must have been the aliens, you know. People think that I believe that you know, that I've been abducted by aliens and they start comforting me. And do you really believe that? I'm like, you know what? It doesn't even matter. It's it's ridiculous that I even said it. And that's what's funny. And you're not getting it. <laughs> Right, I'm gonna let you go, Lauren. Um, but I, I really, really am glad that um, that we spent the time and spoke today. It's been great. Thank you. It has been awesome. Good to talk to you. Okay. Bye. -bye. Thanks.